Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. So as many of you know, podcasting is kind of a weird business because a lot of the most popular shows consist of podcasters interviewing each other, which is kind of strange when you think about it because technically I suppose we're all in competition against one another. And so why do we spend so much time just doing one big collective on-air schmooze? I've never really been able to answer that question, which is why I generally avoid interviewing other podcasters. But I do make exceptions, and one of them is today's guest, fellow heterodox liberal Megan Daum. As many of you will know from her previous appearance on the Quillette podcast, Megan is a New York-based book author, writing coach, social media maven, and more recently, the woman behind a new set of events where, and here I'm going to quote from her promotional materials, intellectually curious, aka problematic, women from everywhere on the political spectrum can talk honestly about complex issues and ask meaningful questions to which there are no easy answers. Recently, Megan joined me to speak about the unspeakeasy and a dozen other things besides. Megan, thanks for being on the podcast. So I'm looking at some of the information here about unspeakeasy. Is, is that how you pronounce it? The unspeakeasy, yes. And so you've got very sophisticated graphics. It connotes a kind of, as the name suggests, prohibition era secret meetup club images of women in flappers dresses and stuff like that. People don't have to actually dress like that when they show up, right? Well, we're working toward that. It's not like a 1920s cosplay, is it? No, no, we're, we're LARPing <laughs> as uh, people who are having a good time in life. <laughs> no, so The Unspeakeasy, it's named after my podcast, The Unspeakable, and that podcast was named after a book I, I wrote called The Unspeakable. So it's just sort of all sort of under the unspeakable imprimatur. Your podcast, it's about some very serious subjects. And this is an issue we faced at Quillette, where when you invite people to an event, and there's a social aspect to it, people want to have a good time. And you see this with book clubs here in Toronto, where, where I'm sure it happens in book clubs everywhere, where you pick a really high concept book, and then people show up at your book club, and they spend like an hour bitching about their kids. Oh. Because when people are at a party, they want to unwind. Now, you've already done sort of a bunch of proto events like this before formalizing it like this. Is there a tension between people come, they want to have a good time, it's a social event, but at the same time, you're trying to keep them on message, like, hey, we're here to discuss serious ideas? Well, it's funny that you say book club, because a lot of the women that come to the Unspeakeasy that express interest in it have had a book club incident. So uh, something has gone wrong in their book club. Or... BCI. BCI, as it's known in the literature. BCI. Book club incident or a uh, FBM, which would be a Facebook meltdown. Oh, yeah. Okay. Very common. Those are the two categories. So I should sort of clarify what the unspeakeasy is. It's a, it's a community. So it has a couple of different iterations. It's a membership-based online community where we have different discussions. We have a book club within the community and we talk about all sorts of things. But kind of the signature offering are these retreats that I run. And its it, I wouldn't call it a party. These are usually two or three days. People apply to come. This is a women's free speech, free thought, heterodox community. Sometimes I call it a women's shelter for the politically homeless. Okay. This is something that people come to very deliberately because they want to talk about particular things and they want to talk about it with a lot of nuance and curiosity. And I screen them. So, you know, they have to apply and they need to tell me why they want to come and what they're interested in. And then I curate a series of discussions based on what, what they're interested in. And I bring in guest speakers and it's, it's that kind of thing. We certainly have a, a good time, but it's much more than a, than a party. Although we do have parties sometimes. One of the goals, and you make this clear, is you know people want to be in an environment where they can actually say what they mean and mean what they say and relax to some extent. I mean, one of the reasons they're coming to you is because they feel like tense and agitated when yeah. they're with maybe formerly their friends or maybe even still their friends, but kind of like the range of topics they're allowed to discuss is, is low. But let me ask you about curating these things because 
the movement against cancel culture has been around for a couple of years now. And what I've noticed, either in real life or, or online, is that you get a lot of very well-intentioned people, smart people like, like yourself, who want to curate forums where people can talk. The problem is that you get 20 people, you get 50 people, you get 100 people in a room who are all devoted to that concept. Statistically, it starts to become likely that you're going to get at least one or two people in there who just start talking about legitimately crazy things. <laughs> and then no one in the room wants to say anything because it's like, well, this is supposed to be a free speech club. And so I guess if this person wants to like go on about the moon landing or vaccines or, or they have weird views about geopolitics, we kind of have to indulge that. Mm. And then you get into the, well, we can cure that with screening, but screening itself connotes a kind of gatekeeping function. There's tension there, right? You've got a velvet rope to let in people who are, to some extent, complaining about velvet ropes, right? Yes, that's true. And that's actually something that we talk about a lot inside the velvet ropes. <laughs> I think the best way to get into this, because I mean, you raise a good point, and it's something I think about a lot. This enterprise really came about as an extension of writing workshops that I teach. You know, I'm an author, long time. I've been a teacher. I've taught at Columbia University. Now I teach private writing workshops, generally in, in memoir. And I also teach workshops. I used to do them in my apartment in New York, these weekend long seminars. And now I do a lot of private workshops on Zoom, people all over the place. So I started noticing two or three years ago that people were coming into my workshops. And by the way, my workshops are not ideological at all. This is like standard right. memoir, personal essay. They're not just women, there's women and men, but a lot of women in particular were taking these things. And I started noticing that sometimes they didn't even want to have their pages workshopped. They just wanted to have a place to talk. They were fans of my podcast, The Unspeakable. They had, they had read my books. And it was clear to me that they were they just were craving a space to have these conversations with people that they knew I knew could also have those conversations. And I started to think, gosh, like, why are we having a writing class here? Like, why don't we just have a space to have these discussions? And, you know, I'm the last person in the world to start a women's community. It's actually pretty hilarious. I mean, a lot of what I have written about that has gotten me in trouble has to do with criticizing the sort of feminization of the culture, as I like to put it, and the overreach of Me Too and all that kind of stuff. But I noticed something about the way that women were responding to the culture wars, which is they, they were much less likely to speak out and share their opinions because they feared the social penalties that come from other women. And I also noticed in the heterodox space, the space that we're in, there are some women in it for sure, some very prominent women, but it's pretty male dominated. And so that's where I got the idea for the unspeakeasy. You have this statistic that I saw in some of the materials that you were sharing with me. 84% of Americans say being afraid to exercise freedom of speech is a serious problem. And then when they were polled about their personal behavior, of those who held their tongues, 61% were women. Yeah. And look, I'm trying to stay in my lane here because I'm a man and I, I don't want to speculate too much on why that's the case. But we've had people on the show who are women who say specifically in feminist spaces, they felt they were kind of expected to maintain like a kind of solidarity with other women and yeah. solidarity becomes a kind of consensus and consensus becomes dogma and then dogma becomes fear. And so it starts out with we're a sisterhood, all for one, one for all. But then depending upon the ideological atmosphere, that can become a kind of cult think. Yeah. And I think that there's something about the way women interact with one another that there's like a lot of bat signals going on. I mean, I'm not the first to say this. When, when men argue or fight, it's physical. They use their fists, right? And so women, for obvious reasons, have adapted so that their modes of competition and of aggression are very much done through social exclusion. Talking like schoolyard stuff. Yeah. I actually think that the, the dynamics of mean girl in-group, out-group dynamics have mapped themselves on to the culture wars in a way that people are really afraid to talk about for a variety of reasons. The, the result is that women just aren't talking. There aren't as many women podcasters talking about this stuff. There are some, but they're not as many as there are men. And worse to me is that on the ground, you just have a lot of people and a lot of women who hate this stuff, whether it's DEI or gender stuff or 
arts and culture, censorship, what they can read, what's being taught in the universities, what's happening in their kids' schools. Most people are pretty reasonable about it, but they're not saying the things that sound reasonable. They're going along. They're nodding along with the most unreasonable people because they're afraid of being tarred as on the wrong side. And it's like the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> and so it really became clear to me that I could carve out a space and we need more spaces for people to just have reasonable discussions and share opinions. I mean, we do not agree on everything. Our retreats, we have 15 women, they're small. And so there's about 15 different opinions to everything we talk about. So I have three daughters and I'm thinking a little bit about how they navigate this stuff. Even from the time they maybe were like in elementary school, certainly by middle school, they kind of knew what they were supposed to say. They knew what they were supposed to think, at least for public consumption. And then maybe with their trusted friends, they're more unguarded. And, and their social media tends to be heavily curated. It's like, well, I can't put this picture on because so-and-so wasn't invited to the party and they'll be pissed off. And they're incredibly sophisticated as publicists and networkers and diplomats, <laughs> yeah. even like by the time they're 13 or 14. Would you say that your audience is maybe women who, who remember a time when they didn't have to do that, at least when it came to politics? Well, so I'm a Gen Xer, as are you, I believe. I mean, we definitely skew in that direction, but we have members from their early 20s into their 80s. This is not like some kind of girl boss cabal. We have small town librarians and business executives and college professors and women who work in the trades, electricians and plumbers. And it's quite remarkable. But, you know, one of the things that's key is that it's totally off the record. There's no phones. Nobody's doing the Instagram. Nothing is recorded ever. Um, and we're on the honor system there. If anybody was to violate that, they certainly would not be asked back and they wouldn't be in the online community anymore. Again, it, it opens you to the charge of hypocrisy, right? There is this sort of idealized anti-cancel culture ethos that says nobody should be canceled for saying anything to anybody. But that's not the world we live in. Right. I mean, that's not realistic. And, you know, we certainly don't talk about culture war issues on the nose all the time. I mean, we've had discussions uh, about abortion, say, that were just fascinating. I mean, one of our earlier retreats, this was in upstate New York. We had, I think, 15 or 16 women at this one. And there was this conversation about abortion, and it went on for about an hour, maybe two hours. And it was like one of the most sort of magical, riveting conversational experiences I've ever had. It ranged from, I don't think abortion should be allowed really under any circumstances, maybe with a few exceptions, to abortion on demand regardless, and everything in between. And they were sharing their personal experiences, but also talking from a place of real knowledge, understanding of the legislative issues, and I just kind of sat back. I, I didn't really say very much. I mean, I sort of facilitate these things, but then I let them talk. And that kind of thing goes on with all kinds of topics. And, and the women come back. I've had many, many repeat customers at these retreats, and no one retreat is the same. Everyone has a different set of conversations. Looking at some of the information about who attends these events, it sounds like there's a lot of people who might be called disaffected liberals. There's very few committed hardcore Republicans or Trump types who come to these events. Is it the case that when people like us talk about ideological diversity and, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom and let everybody say what they want, what they really mean is let a thousand flowers bloom among people who are recognizably liberal, as that term would have been understood 10 years ago. And in this kind of space, you get a diversity that ranges from like classical liberalism all the way to social justice leftists. But you're, maybe not intentionally, you're not really including born-again evangelicals. You don't have anti-vaxxers. You don't really have hardcore libertarians. Is it the case that the kind of space you're talking about, yes, it's ideologically diverse, but maybe not in a way that a real red state conservative would recognize? I can tell you that we have anti-vaxxers in, uh, in the online community. You know, the, the COVID conversations are the most difficult conversations that we have. Even more than Gaza? We've been having the COVID conversations for the last year and a half. So there's more of a, there's more of a, a track record there. I can say that they have consistently been difficult. Look, they're coming because they 
our listeners to my podcast and they read my work and what you just described is kind of disaffected liberal sort of center. I don't even know. Are you center left, center right? I don't even know what these things mean anymore. That's what I am. And so, yeah, naturally the people who relate to the way I think and what I say are going to be drawn to this sort of thing. But I can tell you that we do have people in the community who have voted for Trump. Actually, we have people who speak about having not voted for him the first time and being repelled by him, but also being so frustrated with what's going on that they would consider voting for him next time. I mean, and it's certainly surprising to me. I disagree with that strongly. And so do a lot of other people, but those voices are in there. We have little spats in the in the community on the threads. But I have to say, for the most part, they are just talking about the issues and the the degree of respect and just the people's willingness to interact and sort of meet people where they are is, is remarkable. And they're forming their own communities. I mean, we have people all, all over the world and they're meeting up in real life. They're organizing their own meetups in their own cities. You've got people who are like to the left of Bernie Sanders and probably people who have voted for Trump all meeting for drinks. We'll get right back to the Quillette podcast following this short commercial break on behalf of another exciting meetup featuring heterodox thinkers. I'm talking about the two days of discussions and debate featured at the inaugural Dissident Dialogues 2024 event in Brooklyn, New York, coming this May 3rd and May 4th. At Dissident Dialogues, you'll be able to listen to leading thinkers such as Richard Dawkins, Steven Pinker, Ian Hersey Ali, John McWhorter, Constantine Kisson, Francis Foster, and more, including me. I'll be there, so come say hello. This is a gathering where everyone is part of the conversation. Conservatives, progressives, religious and secular thinkers, left, right, and everything in between. Dissident Dialogues presents a rare chance to immerse yourself in a conversation with some of the most influential thinkers of our time, tackling important topics relating to religion, science, politics, and culture. If you're driven by intellectual honesty, curiosity, and a desire for the truth, Dissident Dialogues is the place for you. Buy your tickets now at dissidentdialogues.org and be part of the conversation. Dissident Dialogues. It's not just an event, it's an intellectual journey. And now back to the Quillette podcast. In the last months, the Gaza thing has broken, not just friend groups, but like you have law firms where people yeah. don't talk to each other here in Toronto over this issue, volunteer groups. Jewish organizations, there was a you know, front page article in the New York Times about a prominent legal defense fund based in Brooklyn that's kind of just falling apart over this issue. You know, it sounds like you're effectively the webmaster of this social media space that you're curating. Are you telling me that things haven't been pushed to the breaking point in some cases over the Gaza issue? We've had some hard moments. I mean, I, I keep my eye on it. Right after October 7th, there's an incredible amount of pain a lot of people were feeling. We actually had a retreat a few weeks after, we had a, a retreat in Pennsylvania in, in the Poconos. At the end of October, there were several women who were Jewish who came, and there were one or two that were worried about having to think about anything other than Gaza. Although a few said, I would like to think about anything other than this. We really just focused on the effects of the polarization around the issue. I mean, I'm not equipped to, to facilitate conversation about the Israel Palestine conflict. I'm not going to presume to do that. But I think we were able to talk about just the emotional, psychological effects of the divisions. A couple of weeks ago here in Toronto, I was asked to moderate a uh, pretentious word, but I'm going to say it, salon, for, <laughs> for people who kind of answer to the description of, it sounds like your clientele. These tend to be smart people who were disaffected. To be honest, my role is mostly comedy relief because this stuff can like get kind of heavy. The Q&A at these things is always interesting because, first of all, by the time this Q&A, there's been an intermission and people have had a few drinks. And so they kind of get to the point pretty quickly about how they arrived in that space. And what I found is it tended to be gender and in particular this thing like biological sex doesn't exist. And if I say I'm a woman, I'm a woman. And that issue broke people. And they said that. They said, I'm here because I was a leftist. And then I just can't stomach this, this nonsense anymore. And of course, I be honest, I have sympathy with that position. 
The position that it's nonsense, not the position that I could be a woman if I told you I'm a woman. If you really want to come to our own speakeasy, you can say you're a woman. I just, I, you know what? You picked up on my <laughs> subtext there that I was sort of angling just, for. It's a long game, yeah, you know, John. Just yeah. yeah. Well, I noticed, but we'll we'll talk about that later. But it, it sounds like you're going to open some events up to men. But we'll we'll talk about that in a bit. The but the other issue that really motivated people, and they said again, they said this during the Q and A because because as you know from events like maybe 50% of Q&A questions are actually questions. Yes. Often it's people give a speech and then say, oh, what do you think of that? Right. More a comment than a question. Yes. And the other thing was vaccine stuff. Yeah. You know, a lot of people said stuff I was uncomfortable with, you know, stuff about Fauci and stuff about um, big pharma companies and their allegedly malevolent intentions and stuff like that. Like, do you find it sometimes the case that people come to these events saying, oh, I'm here for discourse, I'm here for conversations, of you know, open minds, new relationships. But then like when you scratch the surface, they want to drill down on one particular issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think everybody has their kind of on ramp into this, right? And we certainly get a lot of women who have come into this because they've got kids who are caught up with the gender stuff. They've got gender dysphoric teenagers. And, you know, a lot of them are involved in, you know, there's there's Genspect and there's, a, you know, a lot of parent groups coming up around this stuff. And, and, you know, that's a subject that I've covered a lot on my podcast. And like I said before, I feel really strongly about covering that in a particular way. There are guests that I will not have on to talk about it. And there are guests that I will have on gladly and, and, and repeatedly because I really like the way they approach the subject. But in, in the online community, for instance, the way it's organized is we have, I mean, I don't even know how many categories we have now. We have maybe 10 or 12 different discussion forums. So it's like, you know, climate and science, public health and medicine and arts and culture and gender and feminism. You know, these are all categories. And, you know, certain people are more active in, you know, certain categories th than others. So I think, you know, the, the dynamic that you described, it, it probably plays out more in the online community and it, and it's fine because people talk about what, what they want to talk about in there. But, you know, in terms of the in-person retreats, I design a schedule ahead of time, you know, and it's like, we're going to talk, you know, we're going to spend this 90 minute block talking about, you know, what's happening in books and in films and in with censorship and, and sensitivity readers. And we're going to take a break and then we're going to spend another 90 minutes talking about something else. Sounds like you get rid of a lot of the eye rolling rituals that lately have come to attend some of these events. <laughs> like you say, there's there's no land acknowledgement. I mean, some people like land acknowledgements, but it sounds like you don't have them. There's no breakout groups. So it's not like you're segmenting it. There's no talking sticks. What the hell is a talking stick? Yeah, I think that this is a thing. I think it's kind of big like Silicon Valley when they have their retreats. I, th I think the talking stick is like if you're sitting in a circle and people are you know, having a discussion, there's like a stick and you pass it around and you can only speak while you're holding the stick. Okay, so the stick doesn't talk. No, that would be great if it if it did, right? If if the if I could get a talking stick that talked, it could be like my substitute for my for my podcast. So you're not allowed to talk unless you have the stick. And I now that I'm saying this, I wonder if it this is like a, a, an indigenous or Native American kind of kind of ritual. Well, I don't know. A lot of the stuff that is claimed to be indigenous is it's sort of like indigenous by way of Brandeis. Yes, exactly. So that so no, we don't have anything like that. We did actually, um, we were one of our earlier retreats, uh, we were using a retreat facility where and we were eating, we, we all eat together, we have our meals together, but we were in this larger dining hall. And there were a couple other groups and the they did a land acknowledgement <laughs> before the meal, like the retreat on behalf of the retreat center. But the way they did it, you know, it was this poor like dining hall, the woman who was managing the dining hall she just had to kind of get up in front of everybody and and read the statement robotically you, you have here unless explicitly stated otherwise what happens at an unspeakeasy retreat including names of participants stays at the retreat which kind of sounds like a little bit like las vegas well it's fight club <laughs> that's the kind of thing you say when people are doing the swingers cruise or aa meetings or a gay nightclub where you're not allowed to take pictures because some people aren't out on the one hand, you're trying to tell people, like, there's nothing wrong with you. Like, you're not the crazy one. It's okay to have heterodox opinions. But then on the other hand, you're saying, but don't tell anybody I was here. Right. Just doing research. Yeah, exactly. I think that is just kind of, the, there are norms around private conversation. So much of the problem now is that every single idea and every single thought is just immediately made public. It's like somebody has a random thought and instead of hashing it out with their friend, they just go tweet it. 
nothing ever gets cooked. We're just swimming in, in half-baked ideas all the time. So I think it's really important that our, our retreats are off the record. And it's, it's not because we're sitting around saying horrible, you know, terrible racist things. I, I wouldn't let that happen. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine that happening because I know who's coming and I know who they are. And, you know, in, in the beginning, I was actually having z- private Zoom meetings with every single applicant. So they understood what it was and I could get a sense of where, where they were coming from. But the fact is we're still in a moment where a lot of people are not safe to talk about these things. I mean, I have people come to retreats, women in the community who are professors, they have academic jobs, they have all kinds of professional situations where they would be stigmatized and potentially penalized if it was known that they came to a retreat. I mean, it's, it is mind blowing. It is truly mind blowing that something like this would be considered potentially a a cause for being terminated from your job, at least problematized, but that's where we are. We had somebody who who wrote something for us on Quillette on the gender issue. This is maybe a year ago. And uh, and I said to this person, wow, you know, this, you should really come on the podcast. And they said, look, I'd love to come on the podcast and talk about how biological sex is real. However, I have this niece who just came out as non-binary and the holidays are coming up and I'm trying to lay low on all this stuff because I want to get through the holidays without some fight. It sounds like some of those people are doing their sanity check under your auspices at your events. That's maybe one of the few places they really can. Yeah. And some of the people who do their sanity check with us are some of those blue hairs. Okay. Nothing wrong with having blue hair. You can have any hair color you want. There's the blue hair that you have like when you're in your 70s and your 80s and the the blue hair you have when you're when you're in your 20s. You know, we had a woman, she was very young, she's in her 20s. She had, you know, gone to a very very liberal arts school. She had identified she was gay. I think I can say that. She was very involved in the queer community, uh activist you know, social justice circles as a college student, and then just kind of got her head whipped around by the whole gender stuff, but felt absolutely unable to be honest with her peer group. It it was really affecting her life. I mean, she felt totally alienated. She felt that she could not be herself among her friends. And so she came to us. It was great. I mean, she was on a scholarship, you know, by the way, we, you know, I'm starting a a fund, you know, we want to be able to have women come who might not necessarily be able to, to afford the tuition. So this woman was on a scholarship and she was by far the youngest person there. It was incredibly valuable for her to interact with with older women. It was really valuable for us to hear about her experience. We don't understand a lot of this. We think we do. We listen to all the podcasts, but we don't know what goes on in a dorm room. So that kind of thing happens all the time. You know, I wonder what you would think of this. One of the groups that is the most worried about being uh, known to be associated with the Unspeakeasy are, are therapists. We have a lot of women who are therapists the sort of social justice activism piece of the psychotherapy world now is so dominant that they're afraid of sort of being known as the therapist in the community who might not be gender affirming or might have dissonant views on this. And it's extraordinary. Those women are usually by far the most afraid to have it be known that they're there. And there Mm. are so many, there are a lot of therapists there are a lot of Canadians. So we had Julie Bindle on this podcast, good old fashioned feminist rooted in working class British feminism. I, I don't know which wave she is. I, I was lose track. She's a solid second waiver, I would say. I'll take your word for it. I, I, I always get my waves confused. <laughs> but she called Canada Tranada. And she had come here from England to do research for a book specifically on the question of what happens to a Western country when its government and public institutions are taken over by people like Justin Trudeau, who on this issue are glassy-eyed doctrinaire believers in the idea that two plus two equals five when it comes to defining what a woman is and protecting women's spaces. So Canadian prisons, female prisons are full of men. So it doesn't surprise me that your meetups have a lot of refugees from Tranada. Yeah. And it's not just the gender stuff in Canada. You know, uh, Tara Henley, who's I'm sure is a a friend of yours. Former CBC. Yes, former CBC 
she has a wonderful podcast, Lean Out. I think she's a I think she's a brilliant interviewer and I love her podcast and I love her writing. She joined us on a retreat. She's she's spoken publicly about it. So I, I'm allowed to say that. And she talked a lot about these things and she gave also a wonderful presentation about her own thinking, um, not, a, not about the gender stuff per se, but about kind of the, the socioeconomics of, of the mating crisis. And I mean, one of the things we do too is, you know, our, our participants often give informal presentations based around their own work or their own experience. And we've just had some extraordinary discussions around these things. I mean, we had a woman who had been in a mass shooting maybe 20 years ago and pretty seriously injured. And nonetheless, she has pretty libertarian ideas about guns and gun control. She gave a long talk about that. And Katie Herzog was actually a guest speaker at that retreat. Katie came and um, spent the night with us and Katie was able to sit in on that conversation. And um, she has said herself, it's like, it was unlike anything she'd ever heard. And, and I actually disagreed with this woman about gun laws. I, I was really surprised to hear what she was saying. And I certainly didn't agree with all of it, but it was an extraordinary discussion. Like nobody had ever heard anything like this. And it just opened the door for so many lines of, of inquiry. You know, we had another participant in Minneapolis. We did a retreat who was um, a cop. She had been in law enforcement for maybe 20 years. And she talked about what it was like to be in law enforcement in the summer of 2020 with George Floyd. And she talked about policing and what we understand about it, what we don't understand about it. You never get this kind of experience. One of my theories about creating dialogue between people is that the very act of sitting down at a table or in a room and saying, okay, we're going to have a dialogue inhibits dialogue because it's just way too self-conscious. Right. My best conversations with my kids, with my friends, often, I would say always, take place when we're doing something we both love. So we're playing sports together or we're watching sports together or we're having a great meal or we're cooking. Over COVID, I got into this weird sport called disc golf, and I meet all kinds of people playing disc golf. Wait, what is it? Can you tell me what it is? Is it a form of golf? It's like golf with Frisbees. Oh, okay. It's not disco golf. I like that idea. I, I have a story about that, which maybe I'll tell you. After I let the credits roll, I'm going to tell the disco golf story. Okay, we'll keep that for the, for the bonus. So do you have any kind of ideas or plans? It's like, it's great to sit around the room and have a bowl of candy and comfy chairs. But like, wouldn't it be cool if we had this conversation while we were all like, maybe baking is too stereotypical because they're women and disc golf is too obscure. But maybe <laughs> if we were like building a snowman. I know, you know, it's funny because I was I asked a couple of men if they thought that there could be an equivalent kind of men's retreat. Like to me, it sounds boring. That's right. The reason it sounds boring to you, as I think, I'm going to be very gender essentialist here. I think that men, not all men, but but often feel the need to be solving something or building something or moving towards some sort of goal. It's more basic than that for some of, I can't speak for all men, but I, I get physically restless. I had a doctor's appointment earlier this week and... We were talking about whether I should get some test or not. And the guy spent 10 minutes talking. And I was like, when is he going to shut up? Because I was trapped in that office. Really? You should be so happy. Your doctor's sitting with you for more than 10 minutes. I know. This is like a, a total like rich person complaint. But <laughs> I have problems watching movies because it's like, oh, great. For the next yeah. 90 minutes, I have to sit in this chair. So for me, it's something more basic than the phenomenon you're describing. It's just a physical restlessness. And when I'm playing sports or something, I feel calm yeah. because I'm exerting myself. And then I become more receptive to other people's ideas. And also, maybe more importantly, I'm just bonding with them. It's like, oh, you like this sport. I like this sport too. We have something in common. Whereas some of these things where you're exchanging ideas in a room, like, you know, these mortifying things where it's like, Smith College, talk to a black person day, where it's white people and black people go into a room and say, let's talk about what white and black people think. And like, I can't imagine anything more cringeworthy because- It would be better if you were playing disc golf with a black person. Is that what you're saying? The presumption going to that conversation is we are going to do nothing except stare into each other's eyes and talk about the color of our skin. Oh yeah, no, it's the worst. It sounds like this unspeakeasy thing is much more relaxed and, and it's not like that. But still, is there any thought to combining it with bowling or something like that? No. No. Okay. No. We love to talk. Well, I'm not coming. You could come as a guest speaker. We have men come as guest speakers. Would I have to sit down? No, you can stand up. You can pace. You can do your TED Talk thing. You can have your, your pointer. That's fine. You know, so look, women love to talk. I love to talk. I love ideas. I have two podcasts. I talk all day. I can't, I mean, do you sometimes get tired of talking? Like, do you want to just rest your talking self all the time? Yes, all the time. But I can't get them to, to take a break. You know, we talk for about, you know, 90 minutes and then we take 10, 15 minute break. I can't get them to stop. Really? I have to be like, okay, we're stopping now. 
you know, we go to dinner and then we talk over dinner and then they go and have drinks at, at the bar after dinner and they don't stop talking. I don't get women. But that's what women do. The, the thing to remember too is like, it's not just about, you know, having a three day bitch session. The idea is to have these discussions and then, you know, have some sense, A, that you're not crazy, that you're not alone, and that it's possible to have these conversations and then sort of take those tools back into your real life and apply them and be able to maybe speak up, maybe be able to go to the to the Thanksgiving with your social justice niece and be like, hey, these are my feelings about this without feeling like you're a bad person to say that or that you're crazy or that you're wrong. We've had so many women talk about how even just in little increments, they've been able to sort of like be more open and frankly, authentic in their workplace, in their, in their book club, if, if they're still, if they're still in a book club, I've called it a free speech vacation. I've called it a sanity spa, I've called it a talking vacation. You know, if, if you're not into talking, it's not for you for sure. Yeah. Is that great? If the, wow. <laughs> If people want to go on a talking vacation, and, and right now it's, again, in the future, men might be able to go, but right now it's focused on women. Where should they direct their browsers? Okay, they can go to the unspeakeasy.com and there's all the information there about applying for the online community, the retreats that we have planned. Right now I have four retreats for next year have been announced. They're in Austin, Louisville, Kentucky, Los Angeles, and Woodstock, New York. I'm about to add some more. I'm working on our guest speakers. Our guest speakers in Louisville are Corinna Cohn and Nina Paley from the Heterodarks podcast. Oh, they're so funny. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, Corinna is a, is a trans woman. Karina has been on the podcast. Both came to our Quillette social in New Orleans in January. Yeah. They're both hilarious. By the way, they're both board gamers. So after our Quillette social in New Orleans, both came back to the Quillette compound. We rented a place in New Orleans where the Quillette team stayed and we played board games till the wee hours and it was super fun. It was the best part of the weekend. Yeah, so you're you're in for a treat. I'm not gonna play board games, but people wanna play board games with, with those two, they, they can. Sometimes our retreats are just daytime only weekend. Um, this one is a three night overnight. It's, it's at a hotel. You can stay in that hotel if you want. You can stay someplace else if you want. So Nina and Corinna will be joining us for one night and talking about whatever they want to talk about. But we're going to talk about all kinds of things over the three days. Megan Dom, thank you so much for being on the Quillette Podcast. Thank you, John. I love talking with you and I love listening to you talk with other people. You're a great interviewer and I love this podcast. Oh, uh, that's, that's going to stay in the edit. That's definitely going to stay in the edit. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. The other thing, which now that we've lost most of our listeners, and I can just tell you the story, is exactly two people in my life have mistaken disc golf for disco golf. So there's you. And a month ago, I was in London, England. I was actually at a Quillette event in London. And I was staying at my friend Adam Farlow's house. He's a lawyer. He lives in the West Hampstead section of London. And he's from Mississippi. I'm from Canada. So like both of us speak in an accent that's very different from his neighbors. And it was eight in the morning on a Sunday. And I was taking him out to Wembley to London's only disc golf course because I was going to introduce him to this incredible <laughs> rising star of a sport called disc golf. But disc golf apparently is even more obscure in England than it is in other parts of the world. And his neighbor, who is this kindly woman from Scotland, uh, was just coming out of her house and she saw the two of us and I had this big bag of discs. So if you look behind me, you see all these discs. Those are disc golf discs. You had a big bag of discs. That doesn't sound good. Well, they all have different flight characteristics. I won't get into it, but like the way a golfer has lots of clubs, yeah. I have a bag with lots of discs. It's it's a thing. And she said, I'm not going to try and do the Scottish accent because it'll sound ridiculous. I'll sound like I'm from Australia or something and I'll offend everybody. But she said, oh, where are you two gents off to? And we said, oh, we're going to go play disc golf. And she said, so when you sink the shot, do you sort of dance around? And she did like kind of waggle their hips a little like, <laughs> and she actually thought these two middle-aged dudes at eight in the morning were to go out to Wembley, play golf. And then like, after we sink a ball, we'd like turn on some ghetto blaster and stuff. <laughs> but how insane is that? We're going to throw Frisbees into baskets like real athletes. <laughs>